Welcome, Divine Hearts, and thank you so much for being here with us once again. This week, we have the most wonderful guest returning to us. She is Judith Kozel, and Judith is an immense beacon of light on planet Earth at this time. She is a cosmic librarian. She brings through cosmic divine light intelligence, and she brings this through all of her work and offerings through her soul readings with others, through her coursework, and also through her many books as well. And we will be focusing our lights today on one of her most recent publications called France and the Secret Knowledge of Mary Magdalene, the Qatars, Templars and Avalon. And we will be delving much deeper into this with the beautiful light of Judith today. So thank you so much, Judith, for being here and for sharing your light and your wisdom so generously with us. Thank you. Uh, hello, all your beautiful souls, and thank you so much, Lois, for having me back. Yeah, and this uh, book of France has been a labor of love. <laughs> it's not a labor of love, but a gift of love, I would say, many of his arms. Uh, it's a beautiful coffee table, a full book, and it's it's illustrated inside with all my own um, uh, photos and sketches that I made in my journals and my journal entries and uh, the guidance that I had along the way, and also my experiences of all these places. Um, you know, often, uh, this is for instance, Chartres Cathedral, I know you can't see very well, but uh, you yes. can see that, that the camera even picked up the energies yes. of the places, which is just amazing. And um, it starts in Paris, and then it goes to Versailles, and then to Orleans, and, um, and uh, then it goes to... Uh, uh, to Car uh, um, Chartres and then also to, to Karnak and then down into south of France, where, of course, the Templars, uh, that's, for instance, is in Vannes, these old medieval places. And then we get uh, to south of France, um, where, of course, the Cathars were and where the Templars originated from. And uh, it goes into uh, families involved there that were like the keepers of the Holy Grail, the keepers of, of the secrets or, or that which, which has been coming over many generations and, and many, many millions of years. We just, uh, in France, you just don't go back to, to what we have recorded as, as history. Um, it's the same with Britain, it's the same with Ireland, et cetera, because they used to be, there used to be no Atlantic Sea because in the beginning there was only one continent. The geologists could talk about the supercontinent. And uh, when I was doing research for this book, I was deeply touched because you get, uh, you um, in France, especially if you go in that, that upper uh, you know, the upper and the lower parts, we go right into the uh, um, the Azores, we go right into the Canary Islands, North Africa, where they, they, they were always these red-haired people that were like had their roots in the, what would be, the later Celtic tribes were actually all part of this original continent, okay, with of course others, I won't go into that history now, but for instance, Brittany is still very, very Celtic. Um, I felt that Celtic energy there immensely. And, and that connects to Avalon because you must remember that Britain and Ireland and, and Wales and all that was still connected to the main continent. And there are islands offshore from Brittany that, that are just like that. And that's not the Channel Islands. These still belong to France. But you get the Channel Islands too. They were all part of the mainland. Um, Orkney, for instance, was part of Norway. So, um, you, and also North America was still attached to, to the main continent. So uh, you can imagine this was even before Atlantis because Avalon was a third civilization. You first had Elysium, then the Lion Kingdom. And when the Lion Kingdom fell, um, Avalon rose. And Avalon is actually where the original Druidic tradition comes from. But what's so interesting is, um, I just want to show you something. Um, this is in the south of France, and this is in a church 
at Bugarish, um, where I had an immense anointing uh, with Mary Magdalene and Jeshua. And then I, um, also Monster Gould, of course, is right on the cover. Um, that's the most sacred place that you can ever think of. But um, the history then of that area is long forgotten. But um, I came across when I was researching about the Celts, uh, especially because I did, because I was always brought back to actually me standing on the edge of the cliff, you know, and, and um, in those days when I was in France, I always used to have a red dress that I wore and a white horse. So I was standing there with others that, that all had and uh, the mantles on because it was wore mantles because it was a cold, et cetera. But we were looking out into the West, you know, like um, at the, at the, so we, what now is the Atlantic Ocean. Okay. And I was wondering now, why did I have this recall? And then um, I came through a book that was written. Um, actually, in any case, it's, it's one of the books that I was reading and it, and it actually gave me the answer. And it said that the ancient Celts always used to stand on the Western shores. Okay looking over the Atlantic, mourning the loss of the original homeland. And I thought to myself, wow, okay, now everything starts falling into place and everything starts to, to um, fall into place in a higher degree. So the lands are ancient. It's just that, our, that the recorded history then was not needed because that was in the seventh dimensional state and it was not necessary to write things down because a human still then can um, they uh, communicated telepathically they were highly civilized beyond our ilk now that we have and more than this they um they were um i say they did not need to record anything because they knew how to tap into energy and energy fields. And that's exactly what will happen to us when we go back into the new earth, is that we will, do, we will not need computers. We will not need microchips, because you can actually tap into any records you want to, because everything is recorded. I'm not talking about the Akashic fields here. Mm. I'm talking about the cosmic energy fields wherein everything is stored. Um, it's We just had a big thing of forgetfulness. Yeah. That's what it is. And also a lot of times when, when patriarchy took over, um, which is for the last 2,000 years, it actually happened in Atlantis where that happened, um, when the, with the fall of Atlantis, and that is mainly the, the, the control systems, you know, and, and, um, and of course, uh, that also the suppression of truth, you know, and suppression of, of information of what they didn't want people to know, and because what people are clueless, you can do what you like with them, you know, you actually just feed them information, you know, and, and make them believe it's the truth. And then and that's basically what France is all about, because France is almost like she carries a deep depth of her soul that's always sort of got to the fore and rose again. And the last time it arose to the fore was, of course, the French Revolution. Mm. And um, so to me, France... Um, is like a key if you want to unlock the rest of Europe and also Britain because it was one and the same. You cannot really understand why the Western civilization in its deepest form if you try to ignore the role that France, Greece and Egypt, yes, and Mesopotamia, but in the end everything was one. It was never separated. Okay, that's where I stop now. Okay. But what, that, what, yeah, that's, that's basically what I wanted to say because France touches your soul. If you really, if you really go deep and you, you, you just don't travel like a tourist, but you really travel consciously, France opens itself in many ways as a key to unlocking the rest. 
first of all, I'm just going to mention as well um, the the power of your, especially for me, um, your last book, which I read, um, Why I Was Born in, in Africa, and the the power of the imagery, the, the frequencies that are held in the imagery, uh, that took me by surprise, especially the sections that you had uh, on these stones. And uh, there was a deep activation. You had carried those activations in, in those images. And so I'm really excited to experience this book as well, which is going to be waiting for me when I go back to Wales uh, next month. It is going to be this beautiful surprise. So I just wanted to say that because it's, uh, it, it's, it's a multidimensional experience because it's, again, as you are speaking, it's, a, it's an energy experience. It's a, it's a light information experience. So it's a multi-sensory, multidimensional experience. Well, that's a France book. That's a France book as well. Uh, uh, I mean, yes. I, I was sitting in South Africa, and that is, um, you know, as a, as a journey of the Africa book sort of uh, is actually a continuation in this France book because I was sitting in Cape Town and I had to start opening energy fields from Cape Town to France and then from Mauritius to France. And, uh, and interesting enough, but so interesting about how this carries on is now in Mauritius, they have these pyramids. I don't know if you remember the Africa book has got the pyramids in yes. uh, of Mauritius. Now, if, if you go straight over Africa and you go north, you get to the Canary Islands and the exact same pyramids are found in Canary Islands. Okay. They found in the Azores. Mm-hmm. Now, you see, I had to clear those energy lines, and then also it goes to Portugal and France um, in, in, a, in a way that also Malta, we're finding it with it. But there I was already sort of drawing these energy lines right into France, and then I was, before I even left Africa, I already was, was drawing all the energy lines on France that I had to travel. And um, so in other words, when we tried to change our itinerary at one stage, because Christina was a lovely Swedish lady who was helping me um, in France, and she actually said, she'll pick you up in Paris, which I'm most grateful for because I cannot speak French. (laughs) And, uh, you know, to me, uh, to that was such a help, you know, to have somebody who, who, who could speak the lingua franca and also to give me the background because she loves the French people and she has been living in southern France for years. So that was such a big help. But she wanted to change the itinerary around. And they said, no ways do you change the itinerary. You do exactly as you are told to do. And in the end, when we did the, you know, the, the journey, I understood because we were working on so many levels. It wasn't just, you know, what we would think medieval history or history of France as it's ever written around. It was actually um, a different type of journey that, that it unfolded on so many levels. Because, I mean, I'd hardly stepped off the plane uh, in, in Paris. I was in my hotel room when Mary Magdalene appeared to me. And... And to me, that was like, okay, I'm being led on a journey here to remembering exactly why this all and how it all interconnects. Now, you must remember that that uh, in the beginning, as one continent, Africa was always holding that whole energy together. You cannot take Africa out of the equation of any of the world civilizations. Mm -hmm. Because they, they, even if it's east or west, it was still one. And we're returning to that oneness in a greater degree. So to my books are not jigsaw puzzle pieces that put the oneness back into where it comes. And once we understand where we come from, we also understand where we're going to. Because the keys and codes of your soul gets awakened. Because your soul, and there are very so many of these people that were involved in that time, the Templars have returned. Um, and if I talk about the Templars, I talk about the original temples, 
Templars. I'm not talking about the modern ones, okay, because there are splinter groups in that. I'm not talking about that. I'm not interested in that. What, what my book is about is the original core that is there that was started. And if you actually look at the man who started, it was St. Bernard of Clerval. He was a visionary. He was way ahead of his time. And it was through him that this all sort of came back, that they had to remember their roots, okay? And that is why the Templars actually knew when they went to Jerusalem exactly where they needed to go to, and that context there already. So there's so many pieces here, but then you do Dave Dalpa, and it comes to Mary Magdalene and what she, she was born in France. She went to all the mystery schools. She ended up in Alexandria and then in Egypt and then got back to her Jewish roots because they were of a Jewish royal family and they had property in France. And if you look, that isn't actually funny because King Herod had, pr had property in France. He helped her when she came back to France. Um, there was also um, Pontius Pilate had property in France. So you see how the cross, how the cross generated. Um, the, the Nicodemus was actually, um, was part of a, to Jesus, he was like a, yeah, Mary's father. Uh, Mary's, he was related to Mary, Mother Mary. And he was also owned a huge shipping fleet. All right. So. <laughs> You put the shipping fleet together and you understand that traveling was quite happy. You, you could travel anywhere in Europe through the shipping fleets. So is it that, that, that you can actually think of going to them? It was nothing to travel from France to Israel and back again because the Roman Empire was in any case doing the same. So uh, you see, if, if you look at that, it, it, France goes on so many levels but then you need to dig even deeper and you get back to the Druidic tradition, which has been completely suppressed. Why was it suppressed? There's a reasons for it. In the beginning, the Druidic tradition was very pure and that's Avalon. Okay. But then Avalon was destroyed and a remnant of the Druids survived. But you must remember then the Roman influence came in. And, on, and, and with it, the Roman gods and, and whatever, and the Germanic tribes came in as well. So all these different cross-pollinizations of cultures eventually influenced the Druids. And it's so interesting because if you go deep into their history again, which I found the fantastic book, which is originally published in France, um, where they go onto the sun paths of, of the Celts and all the Celtic tribes got so big that they had to split in two. And they had to then uh, to go through the um, Black Forest and went right back into the Black Sea where they originated from by following the sun paths. If you go to Delphi, there you see how Delphi and, and Greece later through Monsegur comes in there because the tribes from Monsegur who were Celts remembered the Celts that were in, <laughs> that were in, in, in Delphi and they wanted the treasures of Delphi. So they laid siege to Delphi for, for about three years. And uh, so you see, you, you, the Celtic history spreads actually over the whole of Europe. But the Celts also had their roots in a far greater and older tradition than that. So you, you cannot separate all of these countries and the whole continents because all is one in the end. And I hope that, that my book helps people to remember into the deeper rememberings of their souls so that it triggers the memory banks and it activates them to understand why we are in this amazing time where we as souls have come back so that those final chapters can be written. The book closed so that we can now finally ascend back to where we were, which is unprecedented because from Avalon, we've, uh, well, from 
um, Elysium and Lion King of Avalon, Lemuria Moor, we fell right to Atlantis, which was in the fifth. And from Atlantis, we fell into the third, so we fell lower than the animal kingdom. And we fell into the seas of forgetfulness. But now we have to return to the truth of who and what we are in truth. And, and to me, that is what this journey was all about. That's so profound, Judith, and you explain it so, as always, so eloquently. Um, and it's, I, I see it as, of course, knowledge had to be taken away in that dissension because it was part of our collective choice to choose this forgetfulness. Mm -hmm. And because we are returning now again, we will begin to remember again. And so the, the importance of your writings um, and, you know, th this awakening that happens within all of us to come and remember. Um, and as you were speaking before about Africa and these core codes within us, our soul awakening to remembering all of this. Um, these are the times when we are going to be doing this now. And so, um, and it's going to be accelerated as well for many of us to, to really come in to remember our sort of, divine lineages and heritage um, and thank you so much for assisting and contributing in that process of remembering for so many of us with your uh, mm -hmm. light wisdom. Speak to us a little bit about uh, what you what you came to remember about you yourself as a Qatar being part of Qatar family and how, how that made sense to you with the Templars as well. Okay, it was it was in a time of my life, um, that was about uh, 2004, uh, when my whole life started to cave in. I see that now part of my awakening. Mm -hmm. And um, at that stage, um, you know, my, my whole life as I had constructed it at that stage was falling apart. And um, in this, I had to cope suddenly with my with my psychic abilities opening up and I had no idea what was happening, et cetera, et cetera. But um, to me, of course, that is what happens when you, when you start awakening in a deeper sense. I've always been awakened, but that was the crucial moment of, of my greater awakening uh, to do the, you know, to start uh, doing the soul work that I've come in to do. But um, I actually was uh, organizing, a, um, well, I was pulled in in the last minute of organizing a classical music festival. And um, the, the guy who was actually pulling me into that uh, was, was some, um, you know, I've known him for a long time. And, um, but he, he's always one that, uh, you know, he's got these bright ideas, but in the end, you know, his bright ideas and what he really focuses on never get together at some stage. <laughs> this is so. <laughs> but that's just the way it was. I, I shouldn't have said yes, but he begged me. And in any case, so I, I got myself into it. And I'd actually really gone into trouble because I had to basically organize uh, the best musicians in South Africa within six weeks, okay? Classical musicians. So it was quite a daunting task, but uh, I got it done. And But the day before, um, this festival was supposed to go in a very old um, uh, Trappist monastery that was actually created by the Trappist monks from Austria um, called Maria Ratchets. Um, that uh, it, it's a beautiful place. It's right on the um, Drakensburg esca escape, um, escarpment near Ladysmith and Natal. And, um, you know, the Trappist, you can see how the church knows exactly where to put their monasteries because it's sort of very high energy spot. But anyway, um, so uh, I, I discovered that, um, I mean, I had a classical pianist coming who is actually not just, he chooses to be in South Africa, but he actually is quite world-renowned. And he said to me before he came, he said um, he wanted a grand piano. So not just any piano, but a grand piano. So I found out there was no grand piano and that uh, a lot of the things that he had actually supposed to organize for the, for the musicians uh, were not materializing into form and being. 
So in that moment, of course, I got really fed up because of myself. But gee, you know, here I'd done all this work and now I would do so embarrassing to have this pianist coming and I haven't even got a grand piano for him. You know, I don't know what I do. Anyway, in that moment, he, he got so fed up. He, he got really angry. And um, I remember that I had my car key in my car and he, he ripped it out and, and he started shouting at me. And in that moment, his face absolutely changed. And I was transported back and I saw myself standing on the, the stake of burning fire with five Knights Templars. It was so vivid, I actually saw their red cross and their white garments, and I was the only woman between this. And he, in this in this priest robe, um, he was having the Bible in his hands, and he was thumping it and singing the Psalter. And that shook me. I, I, I wasn't, you know, I was in the state of shock because this was so vivid. Anyway, this whole thing got um, sorted out. He got into his car and off we drove. And, uh, and the next day, um, I got my uh, my grand piano, which they had loaned from the senator's wife, but it had a broken um, pedal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, in any case, uh, uh, it, it, it actually had a beautiful end because um, this beautiful pianist, I came and I was in tears. I said to him, you know, I'm so sorry, but I haven't got, a, got a, a grand piano for you. And he said, well, can you look? But I said, you know, one of the nuns, because it's now a Franciscan um, a, a monastery. Well, it's not a monastery. Uh, what is it? Um, well, in any case, it belongs to Franciscans now. Beautiful nuns. They do immense work there. And one of the uh, nuns actually loaned us her piano. It was just an ordinary piano. And he said, well, can I look at this piano? I said, well, here it is. And he looked at it and he said, well, I can't play on it. <laughs> I said, yes, I know. But anyway, so he said, okay, where's the ordinary piano? And he said, well, he can't play what he's actually sort of wanted to play. But he said he will just make best of it and he will ask people in the audience what do they want him to play. And I, I had to put the chairs in. And, you know, when he started playing, I was in tears. I was like, um, and he said to me, how am I playing? I said, oh, my goodness, Chris, you know, it, it, I can see your heart and soul in this. And I'm just so grateful. And he said, no, he said, it's, it will work. He, he will do that. And I said, and uh, when the concert was on, he said to me, well, what can he play for me? And I said, fear Elise, you know, from Beethoven. Mm -hmm. So that was just it was just <laughs> so everything turned out well. I just have to say that. So in other words, this man who attacked me, he actually played out his role perfectly. But this picture that that in the end um, uh, was uh, was there with me. It started to haunt me. And um, with that, of course, in the library, I started to look because beforehand I always wondered why I could never look at book at books of France. You know, those big coffee table books that are illustrated. I would I would handle them and I would never open them because as soon as I saw France, I would just like something blocked me. I just wanted to put it away. I didn't want to touch it. And then I started thinking myself, I started reading up about the Knights Templars and, and, and whatever, but, but not so much um, in it, but I started to have recalls. You know, I started to have vivid recalls of myself on a white horse in this right uh, dress. And I had like a scrolls attached to, you know, in, in a sort of a satchet um, at my back and also strapped to the horse. Uh, but also that I was hunted down like like a dog, you know, and often had to seek refuge in caves and so on because I knew the Pyrenees inside and out. And then I saw a picture of Monsegur and I absolutely had the shivers. I knew that was to do with Monsegur. And then I read up about Monsegur and, and the memory banks just opened up as it came. And slowly but surely the memory banks started opening. I remembered my name. Um, um, when I, 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 um, when I saw this, this, um, picture of Fuck Castle, I was absolutely had shivers up and down, you know, and I knew that that is where I come from and, and so on. And, and as these memory banks came, I started writing in my journals as it comes, came in because at that stage, 
um, I was, everything was happening to me in, in a lot of ways. And these recalls would just come on their own. You know, I could never force them. Mm -hmm. If, if something happens, they would come. And it started to intertwine with the Africa book, you know, with, <laughs> without me realizing it at that stage. But as the African um, things started to open, this started to open as well. So it was always interconnected in a way. But I knew that, um, and, and I knew that that deep healing had to come, not only for me, but also for humankind in a, in a deep, deep, deep and, um, and profound ways because of all the destructions, you know, the, uh, humans' tendency to always have this height and then to self-destruct, you know, somewhere along the line. And, and you start to, to sort of unravel the whole. I've always been very, very, very interested in history because you've got to remember from where you come from in order to understand yourself and understand why people react in certain ways. But there's, there's one thing that I've never forgotten, and um, that was when I was working in the, uh, with the uh, colonial archives. And uh, there it came profound that, that um, Napoleon Bonaparte has said something profound. And, it's, of course, nobody would know better than he would, okay? And he said something. He said, history is always rewritten by the victor. In other words, if I conquer other people, I make myself the hero and I rewrite everything. And when I was in Egypt, this was shown me because I always said to Ali, who, who is, was our guide, I said to him, Ali, how do you know that what you're reading in these hieroglyphs is the truth? I don't know why I was asking him questions like that, but sometimes I just ask because I've always asked. And we were at Karnak. And uh, we were standing at the one wall where hieroglyphs is, and Ali called me because he works there. Anyway, so he says, come and have a look here. And the, and the first layer was peeling off, and then there was a second layer behind it, and that was peeling off, and then there was a third layer behind it. So you see that even in ancient Egyptian times, they said what Napoleon said, you see. And it's so interesting that, uh, that that hieroglyph actually got me lately to Wales, where you're going to, where the ancient Wales language deciphers the hieroglyphs in a way that the guy that actually started to decipher the Rosetta Stone actually died before he could complete the whole process. And so his version has become the version of reading the hieroglyphs while the Welsh language very easily actually deciphers it. And there's a man actually that comes from the Druidic tradition that actually deciphered this whole thing. And he's written a whole book about it. So isn't that interesting? So you see again the intertwinement of it. But anyway, so the France book actually took on a path of its own. And... Um, at that stage when this was happening, I had no idea that I would go back to France. But I realized that the absolute trauma and pain that a whole people went through. And then I read the Albigensian, Albigensian Crusade by Zoe Aldenburg, Aldenburg. And that book to me was like it was written from the heart. Uh, they, she didn't just use the Inquisition um, uh, uh, files because that's what most people do. They use the Inquisition files. Now, if you're under torture, you will say anything, wouldn't you? You would not say the truth. And I know for sure that the Cathars and the Templars never, ever gave the truth whenever they were tortured. And that comes out in my soul readings pr profoundly. In the end, when the, when the Cathars were really now, they understood what was happening and why it was happening. Um, all the Cathars actually made a vow and they said, okay, we have done what we could to safeguard uh, what we needed to safeguard. And that is actually in lots of way, the truth of what always has happened to humankind in the spiritual sense. Okay. They knew, they knew Gnosis in the highest sense. 
and in a in other words, that type of illumination that and the purity that goes with it, because they were known as the pure ones, which goes, which we are now starting to tap into. Okay. And that was preserved in their mystery schools in Monsagur, because Monsagur once had pyramids underneath it. Okay. And if you look at Monsagur, there it is. And the Pyrenees means pyramids, okay? Now, their knowledge was so ancient that it was there even before Mary Magdalene was there, okay? And she was part of those mystery schools because she trained there, okay? But this goes right back into the first Lion Kingdom, When these mystery schools were first created. So this, this shows you that there is a knowledge bank that has been accessed by humanity for all that time. Which holds eternal truths. But because we sunk so low, we couldn't access that anymore. And it was held by a pure core of souls that always came to earth to hold that knowledge, even in times of great, great darkness. And that's what the Cathars and the Templars did. And St. Bernard of the Clairvaux was actually trying to preserve in his own way. Because you cannot look at the Templars and the Cathars without St. Bernard of Clairvaux. But... The, the, the core of it is much older, and that is those families that held that actually go back through all the generations to the very first time. So here you have that these, these um, that the Cathars then decided, okay, they are busy annihilating it. It was the greatest genocide that ever happened, happened in southern France. And it steeped right into the very landscape, the earth. You can feel it. It's, 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 it's steeped in. You must remember when a whole people are wide, they were far ahead of Europe at that time. They, they were actually, the men and women had the same rights. They had the troubadours, the love courts. And that love cause was not just the love between a man and the woman. It was the divine love that the divine feminine, which they held in their heart, you see, because they never forgot the divine feminine. And that is why when Esclamont of Foix, who was a sister of a uh, count of Foix, Raymond uh, Raymond, uh, Raymond um, um, he, he, when she stood up at the council of, of the church and voiced what she was, she was actually the real bishop of a Kafar church. They said to her, Madam, go back to your weaving. Mm -hmm. So that the church at that stage had no respect for a woman in any position. And that's why they hated the Kafar so much is because this woman had six of power. The, in, 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 for the Qatar's a woman, were always back. It goes back into that whole troubadour, the, the love courts. The, that's why um, Parsival's um, epic poem is actually um, survived and later got out in Germany from Wolf, Wolfgang von Eschenbach. He, it's actually the original story of what the grail in truth is, if you dig deep. So the Cathar said, okay, we're going to hold the information now in our souls. And because the Kafars and the Templars were actually the same families, they were the core families in that area, these people, these souls, were prophesied to all come back at exactly this time. And they have come back. But you see, the genius of it is that it was, it was remembered in their soul. 
because they know that the soul is eternal. It's infinite. Your soul records are not just the Akashic records which are connected to this planet. They are universal because in truth, we are all sons and daughters of the divine. We are divine. And that soul memory bank is never, ever, can nobody can destroy it because it is forever within the divine source, the source of all that's ever been created. So your soul memory banks, when you start accessing that, actually holds all the information of all the lives and paralives and universes your soul has ever been in. There is no end and no beginning. It's infinite. But unfortunately, when we incarnate on this planet, our memory banks get wiped out as the veils of amnesia came out. But these new kids are something completely different. So we are in a process as old souls that have been now for many incarnations on earth and have now returned in the process of remembering of who and what we are in truth. And that is in truth what ascension is all about. And to me, in France, that was a deep healing journey of my own soul. But it, I had to clear the land in the deepest sense. I mean, the second day I was in Paris, I was already releasing, called upon to release Marie Antoinette. Um, and uh, I've always known I was in the French Revolution and that I had my head chopped off. <laughs> I can't remember much of that lifetime, but that I remember. And um, so to me, that was... Marie Antoinette has been much understood in her own lifetime. And she was a soul that never was free all her life. And that's the first thing when I, when I connected to her soul and all the souls that actually were guillotined there. Uh, actually, she wasn't guillotined, but you can, you can read her real story of what happened to her, which is even more gruesome. Um, the first thing she said, I was always in a golden cage from which I could never escape. And when those souls were released, um, it's the first time ever that I saw the heads coming out first and then the rest of the body. So what they, what, to me, that was the most profound moment of my life. So. To me, there is a, this book goes, you cannot read this book, shall I say, without going through a deep metamorphosis yourself, just like I did. And that is why you cannot separate France from the rest of Europe nor can you separate France from Britain and Ireland <clears throat> and Wales. Because I remember reading Welsh history, because I love history. So, But Wales, Wales, Wales has always fascinated me, and so has um, Scotland and has um, Ireland. And when I went back in my own family history, that goes from my mother's line, uh, Scotland and Ireland and <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so um, when I always, when I read about the history, I thought about the tragedy of it, mm. you know, the tragedy of it. And mainly so because also in the archives that I worked in, it was all about the Welsh miners that were brought in to South Africa to start working in the coal mines, the gold mines and all the mines in South Africa. And um, I remember at one place we had the most beautiful Welsh librarian that he always interacted with. She always made us nice tea and real English, you know, Welsh tea with all the nice goodies, whatever. And uh, so you see, you cannot, you cannot separate Brittany 
you cannot separate Brittany in France from Wales and Ireland and Scotland. They're the same people. Britain too, but Britain lost itself when the Saxons came in a lot of ways with Saxons and, and the Vikings, and of course they all sort of intermarried, etc. Um, because again, if a victor comes, you know, it changes all the history. But um, it's the, 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 the Cathar families, because I remember that my daughter that I had in that lifetime as Cathar, she married an Irish prince that I know. So you see how the Celtic line goes again through southern France and it goes right into Ireland and Britain. Okay. And when I started reading the history of France before, and you get right back to the Celts, because even a Julius Caesar, when he started writing about the Druids, which he reported, uh, in, you know, because he had actually a Druid that he had captured that gave him some information, whatever, probably only the information that he sort of like knew they couldn't get access to the real information, which they would never give to the Romans. And they tell you that when the Romans went to, went to battle, they were much smaller than the Celts. So the Romans were about half the size of what the Celts were, the Gauls, of course, in France, but they were also part of, of um, things. And, and then, then they used to have trumpets, uh, the Celts used to have trumpets and all sorts of musical instruments. And they used to sort of sing and chant and whatever would really put the fear into the Romans. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> to me, that was so wonderful. That was so okay, that was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, um, you go in that when a Celtic chief was buried, they actually diverted the riverbeds and then would make space for all him and his treasures to be buried in the river, and then they would open it again so that the river could flow, so nobody could actually get hold of the treasure. It's, it's these interesting facts that emerge in France that we go back. And, of course, then you go back and you see that the Celtic tribes were right into Spain. And the original sun paths started in Spain. And, and quite uninterestingly, I think it's right in the south of Spain. But you must remember that the Moors took over later, you know, and they took over that whole part of France. Uh, the Moors, you know, when the Islam came in uh, into, into France, you know, you've got Granada and all those places which were absolutely thing. But, but Languedoc, actually south of France, which was Occitania, which was still part of northern Spain. So you take Barcelona and you take um, Aragon and those places were actually part of one single country and that was called Occitania. They spoke the same language. And um, so they were the same families there again. So they always brought in, they brought even originally before the Templars came, they interacted with the Moors. So that's how algebra, how mathematics, how those deep um, knowledge that the Arabs held came into Europe again was through Occitania. So you see how they were vastly ahead of the rest of France. The French king could hardly spell his own name. These were highly educated people. They never belonged to France in the first place. But it's only after the crusade that they were incorporated into France. You, you spoke about the sun paths a few times. What do you mean yeah. by this? Is this linked to the sun disks in any way? I believe so, because the sun disks you will find, I mean, I remember in my Africa book, I start um, connecting with these sun disks. You will find that the, um, if you look at the Celtic shields, you know, the brass shields or whatever, um, they actually were like a replica of what the sun disks originally looked like. Okay. Um, if you go to all these ancient sites, um, like, uh, for instance, in Karnak and, uh, you know, where the standing stones are and also with fine. And I found it um, in Greece everywhere. And uh, also Gnosis. Gnosis is, is one of those where actually uh, the people of the stars, um, um, you know, they are often mentioned in ancient texts. 
Um, they were the great astrologers and the Magi, Magi actually came from this, these people that later had in Haram, they had a huge university and one of the ancient mystery schools was there. Actually, that information came to Europe via the Templars. So they also knew exactly where to go to. You see how the Celts always remembered all the paths and whatever in, in whatever way you look at it. But um, the sun disks were not physical. Okay. Um, they are etheric. I wouldn't say they're etheric, they're energetic. And they are like spinning spirals. That's why you will find, for instance, if you go to New Grange, there's a spirals everywhere. The spirals actually tell you there's telluric energy, which means the spiraling energy on the earth. That's also what the pyramids hold. It's the same type of energy. It's what, what tes it's called Tesla's coil as well, because that is what Tesla was working with, the same energy. You get the earth energy that comes up, but it's also energy that is naturally you, you can generate if, if you know, if you use, if you know how to use it. And, um, and then, of course, the sun disk work exactly on the same telluric energy fields. Okay. And, and, and they normally attach to a much bigger, bigger divide. Well, not, a, it's not, a, you know, we must get past our physicality. Okay. We think that if we can feel and touch something, it exists. But these things can doesn't do not exist in our our three D world. They are in a much higher dimensional state, just like the standing stones and all those are. Um, if you try to access them physically, you cannot access them. Mm -hmm. They are literally living beings. Um, I mean, those those stones in Chikanak, for instance, they they are absolutely sound sound technology and telluric energy. And uh, they were just one vast machine, uh, as whatever way you look at them. And so they, they knew exactly what they were doing when they were placing the stones and how they placed them, and also the shape of the stones. They, they literally sing, they, they, they connect to each other. And it's exactly with any of these old sites you go to, um, you, 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 um, if you touch those stones, you will, you will literally be able to tune into them. But sometimes you will find you can't touch them. And um, I've been here to the stone circle here in, in, um, in Kapsa Whip. That is the oldest one in the world, 250,000 years old. And um, there, there are two standing stones that go like this in the middle. And um, Michael Tillinger said to me, well, you step through it, you know, step in the middle. I said, I will not step into the middle. I know I'll teleport. <laughs> I wasn't going to do that. <laughs> But when, when I stood on the outside of that stone and I just touched it, I was literally pushed back. They, luckily, Michael and, and, and the other guide was standing behind me. They could catch me. I would have fallen over. So the energy between those stones is such that if you are of a certain frequency band, you can teleport to anywhere you want to, and, and not just on Earth. You can go wherever you like to. So... We have forgotten ancient technology that is right there that we, we need to tap into again. It's the same with the dolmens. People were never buried there. Later on, they might have buried people there. It's just like the pyramids in Egypt and also the, the those what they tell the sarcophagus. They're not. I mean, in Egypt, I, I actually start touching a sarcophagus and I knew that, that you, that they were never ever meant to have buried people in. They might have done it later when they forgotten, you know, when they could not tap into that higher energy fields again. And it's the same with these sun disks. They will only appear to you when you are tuned into them and you have that consciousness level that you can start tuning into them. And I believe that the Druids could do that because um, because what they do is they will literally, with the information they hold, they are like like uh, computers, I would say, like, like, like the brain of the computer. And what they do is they literally hover over your head and they download information directly into your higher mind. So there can be no distortion of information. There can be no lie. There can be no sort of, you know, you know, like humans do, it's watered down information or it's filtered information or what they want you to know information. And so this cannot be distorted by anyone. 
And that's why they are in the higher dimensional state. If you're not pure enough and you, you and, and you, you know, you, um, the cosmos always reads your intention. What is your intention behind wanting to know information? Are you going to use it to destruct and destroy, like make weapons of it? Okay. Like humankind are inclined to do. Or are you going to use this for higher good? Are you going to help people that way? Are you going to assist humanity that way? Lift them into a higher consciousness field, okay? And the, what I found in France is, 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 is you stand in, in places, even in Versailles, which, by the way, was one of the greatest sun, sun temples in Europe, stood in Versailles. And there's old Louis, uh, the King Louis, the, I think it was the 12th that first had the idea of building that palace. When he, when he, he, when he I, I don't, I don't think he knew what was there. You know, he, he just built his sun temple up. He's his palace there, which he called the sun palace, but not knowing, you know, that it was where the original sun temples were. And interesting, there's even a statue, a beautiful sort of cave type of thing for Apollo there. And of course, Apollo is, was known as a sun god, you see. So somebody knew something about it when they when they when they actually built the the palace there. But um, I mean that energy there or those places. What what happened is when all the destruction came as it, uh, Avalon fell, okay, and and then of course Atlantis fell. So we you see we had these terrible destructions that that came one after the other, and the whole face of the earth was changed. You know, landmass sank under the sea. Rivers were formed. Um, Paris, for instance, was right, a sacred la uh, um, lake, uh, the hole where the Seine now is, and actually where the Notre Dame is and that island there, and also where Mary, uh, yeah, Marie Antoinette was, was sacrificed. Um, all that was part of a huge inland sea. Paris was part of a huge inland sea. And there was a very, very sacred island that was dedicated to the goddess and held one of the greatest mystery schools was right there on that island. So the sin then did not exist. It came later. All right. So, so uh, to me, France once held all these sacred sites within her and later, because if you read about uh, the first first uh, French kings, they actually had to use moats in order to um, dry the swamps and things and around in around Paris. So you can see that there, there again, history is confirming what I was picking up in a, in a greater degree. So you, you France moves into many states of consciousness in its through its existence. And um, then you had the Celtics coming. Uh, the Celtic originally also came in from, from the east and then, but also from the west. And these ancient sun paths where, where, where these, these um, original um, uh, um, Avalon uh, um, uh, connections were between the places and um, they were always marked okay and I believe they were marked either by standing stones later on or they would mark them in some or other way so that when the later roots came to these places they always knew where to, they were like markers on their journey. So they would actually know, okay, this one connected to that one. And I believe they could access maps that they had. Mm. But they, but you must remember something about the Druids. And this is what most people do not understand. They always say, oh, the Druids had no written language. Okay. They, 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 they were stupid. All right. <laughs> they were so close to the earth. They just had sacred groves and they, they actually just worked with Mother Earth and so on. That is not the truth. Because actually, it was even recorded by no one else but Julius Caesar, okay, who said that if you wanted to become a junior Drude, okay, that's the most junior rank. You had to go through 21 years of training. Okay. 21 years of training. They 
were master astrologers. They were master astronomers. They were master mathematicians. They were master scientists, metaphysicians, metaphysicians. Yes. Yeah, physics, yeah, sorry. I'm getting it. My tongue is twisting, yeah. They were well versed in 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 um in what we in consciousness, the higher consciousness. They could teleport, they could bilocate, they could shape shift. Okay. They they were known for their magic abilities, but what is magic different from knowing how to manipulate? Late energy and energy fields. So, did they need written books? No, they did not need written books. They would, there's a standing stones that are, you know, have everything they in it. You, you can go and, and, and if, if you have a consciousness, you can tap, as I said, into any energy records that are there, which they could do. They knew how to manipulate energy. They knew how to read energy. Now, that's not things you can read in the textbooks because nobody will understand what is going on anyway. Uh, you see, the human language that came only after the fall of Atlantis has hampered us so much. It has put us into the mind frame where we can only see that far and not further than that. And whatever we can't see, we believe is not true, and that is not true. <laughs> I mean, we, we think it's not there. But the thing is, most things are invisible that are in truth. The Druids knew that. So they knew exactly if they would stand in this circle, they could teleport themselves in that circle. Okay, easy, if you know how. And and. These people that are highly trained in these, these metaphysics, they even know how to make themselves invisible. Because you see, in ancient times, you didn't have, uh, the higher you go in consciousness, the less solid you are, okay? You, you're not hampered by this physical form. You can go anything. If you read about Houdini, he was the greatest magician that was ever, well, sort of recorded in human history. Yeah, they actually locked him up in a prison where they said nobody could ex um, ever escape from, and he managed to escape through that. Okay, so what else did he do but make himself? He dissolved himself and then put himself back together again, okay? And that, <laughs> it's, it's, it's very, very, uh, it's technology, but it's also know-how that we have forgotten about. And, you know, I, I always see that with, with the intergalactic spaceships. They have that technology. They know the know-how. They can make themselves visible and invisible any time they choose. It's our humanness that is, that is why this consciousness shift actually goes through your heart center. Because your heart is directly connected to your soul. Your soul is infinite. It's not hampered by anything. And once we start to expand our consciousness, once we open up our higher transmitter channels, there is no limitation to what we can access. But you have to reach that higher level. But most people are so stuck, stuck in the doctrines, in the false information that is given us, in the lies as Napoleon demonstrated, the victor always rewrites history, that if you do not ask questions, if you don't seek the truth in your higher sense, you're not ever going to be able to tap into the truth of your soul and that divine truth that is forever there. And that is, that is where like these people that actually dared to, to store this were always so persecuted because they were a threat to the status quo and the, the false information that was held as religion or whatever. I'm not against religion, please. I'm just saying that, unfortunately, there were those that have hijacked certain aspects of that 
and then actually said, this is the truth when in truth it's not. And now the truth is starting to come out everywhere because it's starting to open up and it's coming from, from ancient manuscripts that they suddenly found like the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's why they won't publish the Dead Sea Scrolls because there's too much things in there that they, they know is going to break down everything that they've ever done. And, um, or ever, or ever said this is the truth. You see this, believe this, you know. So, um, if you actually start reading, reading, uh, reading the Gnostic text, um, then you start thinking Jesus actually proclaimed something completely different from what people understand now as a doctrine that is often given, you know. Um, <clears throat> I mean, in the library, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful that I ended up in the library. I often had to read things that nobody else would ever have access to. And that opened me up to always seek for the truth, you know. Um, and you must remember that even libraries already have like a, a sort of a section, oh, I don't want this book in, in on stock, you know, it will open up people and so on. So they already filter information through. All the information that we are given is already filtered. So if you really want the truth, then go and find it in your soul because that's where your truth will be because you can access the universal truth. But most people don't bother about it. They, they, they not. And um, but what I'm really getting to, to this is now is that we have the opportunity now as souls not only to remember, but also to start to find truth within. And the truth that is your truth, okay, will always resonate within your soul, within your heart. You will recognize that as the truth. It, it, will, it will be your frequency band. It will be that which speaks directly into your heart. And that is what you should heed more than any outside information that is ever given to you. So, to me, that is what, the, what Mary Magdalene was bringing. You know, what I found so beautiful about France is, is the, the greatest genocide might have happened in, in, because she actually went from France. She went to Delphi, from Delphi, with, you know, Delphi at a mystery school of its own. And you must remember that in the beginning, Delphi used to belong to the high priestesshood, okay? It was a goddess site. And then the, suddenly there's a patriarchy that comes in with Zeus and Apollo and they slay the serpent. What is a serpent? A spiraling energy, okay? You see, you, you, with mythology, you've also got to start digging a bit deeper to get the higher meaning behind it. And then she went to Alexandria where the Therapeutae were, who were known for their immense healing abilities. So she was a high priestess in her own way. And she married Jesus in, the first marriage was in Egypt because he came back from the east where he had done his training, okay? In the military schools, we were in India and Tibet and in Persia coming back, okay? And the Essenes held the military schools in their community. And they actually were purer than all the Pharisees and Zidisees and all the um, Israeli, well, they're not Israel, but, you know, the, the <clears throat> those people that were there in Jerusalem. So the Essenes, actually, according to the most ancient of writers that recorded it at that time, said they were so pure in their teachings and so pure in the way they lived in communities. They were absolutely self-sustaining communities that they held knowledge which was way from before the flood, okay? This is recorded by the Roman historians and the Jewish ones, that they, had, they actually were far older than that of the flood, okay? So what tells you it came from a much higher source that was even before the flood, before humankind fell into that thing? Now, that was all the mystery schools, okay? There were more of them. But it tells you that when she, when, when Jesus was so persecuted, and she too, and when Jerusalem fell, she went back to Egypt, and from Egypt she went back to her homeland, which was France. 
And if you actually start looking at the French have preserved her memory, you go into any church in France and Mary Magdalene will be there very prominently. So they have preserved her memory in ways I've never seen in a church here in South Africa. The next person they read it is Jean of Arc. Okay. I get told I've got to go to Orleans. So I always knew she came from Orleans, but I had no idea what would unfold. So with Mary Magdalene, and I get to Orleans, and as we were sitting having lunch there, I was suddenly told in the hotel, you've got to go to. I always forget the jolly place's name. Um, it will come. Anyway, this castle now. And this castle belonged actually to the Counts of Orleans. And as, as we got to this, so it's all still in the same district, you know, where she was finding it. And in that castle, she said to me, I will show you where to go in that castle. When I got the way for myself, I know now this energy here is quite amazing at this castle. And I was shown, and when we got in, in that was also very interestingly, a beautiful painting that immediately drew my eye in, in the king's room. And that painting had a castle on it. And that castle, it said in the English translation there, or at least Christina translated for me the French Castle. Now, isn't this interesting? I was went to France because I wanted to go back to Foix and I wanted to go back to Montsegur. And I walk into this castle and I find a picture and there's a Foix castle. There. And later I actually started to go back into the history of that royal line because uh, they actually became the kings of France later, uh, right? And I came to Anne of Brittany. Okay, Anne of Brittany. And then I found that actually the far family never died out. It was for Anne of Brittany that they became the king of France. Interesting. Very interesting. But anyway, so we got to this chapel and it was the most beautiful chapel that I've ever been in. It was it was the Queen's Chapel next to her, uh, uh, what is her chambers. And the energy there, it's incredible, beautiful. And there I saw how, and I was told, her true story and the ox true story but i won't say it here what a true story is she was never a peasant and she was anointed in that chamber and interestingly um christina has been quite involved with some some groups there in france and uh, when we got into this cathedral in vance I think it was, yeah, it was in Vannes. It was in Brittany. Um, after we'd been to Karnak, we went to Vannes. Uh, and oh, there's a beautiful Celtic energy there. It's just amazing. But uh, Christina got me into this, this chapel. I was looking at all the medieval houses there, so I, I was more interested in them because the architecture, you wonder how some of these houses managed to sort of stand, you know, because some of them wobble this side and some of them <laughs> wobble that side. So that was fascinating to me. <laughs> In any case, I got into this cathedral, and the first that appears there as, as a statue is Jean of Arc. Now, if you look carefully, now you see in, in, in the French cathedrals, you must go in and you must go and look in at what is there, okay? What, what have they actually preserved in the architecture, just like Chartres, and what have they put there? And you will find that they have preserved their truths in all sorts of manners. And the uninitiated will walk in there and they won't see for seeing. 
So the first one is Jeanne of Arc. And you see that she actually has part of a hem of her garment open and her knee is exposed, her right knee. And Christina told me that's the sign of a high initiate. So did the church know something that others didn't know? Yes, of course. And then you will find Mary Magdalene. I have gone into churches in France where Mary Magdalene was right in the middle. Now the Templars, patron signs were always Mary Magdalene and it was um, John the Baptist. So if you go in there, have a look around and see whom they put there in the exit. It's very interesting. Chatras Cathedral, I was called to, was doing immense energy work there as well. It's built by the Templars. The Templars always built their deepest knowledge, which they gained, by the way, regained from Haran and those places in the East that they retrieved it from. Their cathedrals are always books that you need to read. I have found things in Chatras Cathedral that I looked at and I thought to myself, there the Templars have put things in clear sight, right behind the high altar. I was like drawn to it, it was like a magnet. And I looked at this, it's in my book, and it was her. Hmm, okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> but you see, most people go into these places unconsciously. Now, Chartres Cathedral was built right on the most sacred of all goddess sites in Europe. And there used to be an ancient serpent mount right next to it, which ended up in Orleans, of all places. So there's interconnectedness in France that goes back. That serpent mount linked directly to where the next serpent mount sits in Avebury. Where are the next serpent mounts? There were some on Ireland, but they were just sort of like waiting in I America. Oh. North America. They were like giant star maps. And they mapped out the serpent energy. Mm. Now, those point directly to Avalon and what was before Avalon and in the beginning when the earth was created, the outer earth, not the inner earth. The inner earth is much older. Excuse me. So, to me, you cannot travel in France without reconnecting to many layers of your soul. And I don't, if you really have a deep, deep soul connection, that's why I say France will bring you back to your soul. Because you cannot go and travel in southern France and travel in the Pyrenees without something triggering within you. And to me, when I was asked to go to Ron Le Chateau, I was in Ron Le Chateau and I said, please get me out of here as quickly as possible. The energies there were absolutely distorted. And when I got outside the castle wall, well, there's places, walls, um, even before I went to France, I knew about the plateau that is outside Rondership too, and I also knew that there were lion, lion fountain there. I mean, I've never been to that place in my life before. That was when I was still at home here in South Africa. And I said, that is where Mary Magdalene's mystery school was. 
and it had a lion fountain in the middle, and it was actually the architecture um, echoing that of the Alhambra in Spain. And they had this rose garden in the middle of in this fountain with a fountain with these lions around it. And interesting enough, an American woman um, bought that piece of land and also um, she's got um, a, a sort of like a retreat center, which is more down uh, the valley. You know, it was just up on the hill. So you just go down there. We actually had lunch. There's called La Bodie. Now I thought to myself, this American uh, woman actually must have sort of tapped into knowledge there that she built this lion fountain there because she wanted to build something else there, but she never got to that. It belongs to someone else now. Anyway, and I was told that day that, that um, you know, when I had my students with it, was when I was doing my seminars, that we have to open up the mystery schools of Mary Magdalene there. And what happened was this because, you see, when Mary was doing her ministry in France, she was already there meeting the same opposition as that, she had, that they had originally in Jerusalem. And uh, those were from those uh, men uh, in, in, uh, in that wanted to stamp the woman out of ministry, you know. I mean, it started with Simon Peter, who didn't want to, you know, he was always jealous of her, uh, mainly because also Jesus was married to her, but also in, in other stuff, he couldn't stand woman, you know, in the ministry. But yet she was, you know, equal in rank to whatever. And this, this sort of spilt over into France. And they, they actually destroyed her mystery school in one night by setting fire on it. And it, it was, to me, it was like opening up that whole area. And, and that mystery school that she had was actually very, very ancient. It was built on something that was far more ancient than even the time that she was there. And so Mary Magdalene's teachings what she brought then from the, you must remember all the mystery schools she was, and then from the Essenes, she brought with her back to France. So this was now already collecting all this knowledge and bringing it back to France, where she originally was. This, these teachings of Mary Magdalene were always preserved. They never got lost. Although the church was stamping it out and all sorts of things because of their own agenda. Because remember, they said she was a prostitute. Now you can't have a prostitute suddenly teaching in France because now the two didn't quite, you know, somewhere along the line. Well, okay, but in any case, they preached Latin in those days, but I suppose it, this was one way. And nobody was more knowledge what they preached <laughs> in any case. Um, with, with love, you know, they played out their role or whatever. And then, um, so her teachings were incorporated into the mystery school that was really here, amplified by those which later were the greatest persecution of the Gnostics. Remember that actually the whole Roman church was created by, by Emperor Constantine. Who, does, who was actually not a Christian. His, his mother was a Christian. He wasn't a Christian. He, he wanted a state religion, okay? So he basically created the Roman church, and he decided in the end what went into the Bible and what did not go into the Bible. And then the Gnostic text that they didn't want in the Bible because obviously they, they had hidden agendas somewhere along the line, they started to persecute those. And the Gnostics always had woman bishops, they had woman priests, okay, equal to the men. And the first that got absolutely persecuted were the woman. All right. So these Gnostics and all the, 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 the things came actually then also got to France and it got to England and got to Wales, okay, through, through those whole channels of what then was the, 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 the interconnectedness of those families. So in, in southern France, they literally took that and they, they took it with their own teachings that already were there and then incorporated that. 
because you remember that were originally mystery school teachings that they now would, were from the Essenes, we were scattered now, bringing that back into France and then merging with what was already there. Okay. And some of this merged with the Irish and the British, uh, with the Wales and so on, where, where you had all these connections in Wales and in, in those places. But we, the, the core teachings were preserved. All right. Later, when the Bogomils that, that they always say the Qatars came from were part of another mystery school. So you see, they were always pollinating each other in whatever formal way. And eventually they had to all go underground because of the men's persecution by the church now. So the tragedy of, of the whole Celtic uh, um, 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 preserving of their Druidic, uh, um, very highly spiritual knowledge that they had, which also ties in with the original mystery schools, were when the, when the, the same Roman church got into England, uh, where of course where Romans were in England, uh, were finding it, yeah. with that came the church. And if you start reading the history of Ireland in the beginning, how they hacked their druids to pieces, especially the women priests, and also the same happened in Wales, they actually forced the druids that were sort of, a, well, 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 not wanting to get killed, they incorporated into the monasteries, the men, not the women, okay. And they were lighter forced to become Christian monks where they were not. And if you look at the book of the Celts, that's so Celtic. It was actually those Celtic monks that were originally Druids that had contributions to, contributions to that. But if you actually look in the greater history of the church, they did exactly the same in South America. They did the same in Mexico, wherever they conquered. You see what, again, what, what Napoleon said, the victor always changed everything according to their things. Okay. So it happened in Germany. It happened everywhere where, the, where, where these previous tribes were. I mean, there's a place in Germany called Fjerden in North Germany, where my family originally comes from, where they say up to now the grass will not grow, where they killed all these people, you know, in order to force them to become Christians. Yet, um, I am now just saying about this, where great forgiveness needs to come and great healing. Because nobody felt the brunt of the church more than the woman. So many women were actually burnt alive later by the Inquisition with the reign of terror were women. Women that healed, women that actually still did energy work, which they originally did, women that held that knowledge that they had that was ancient. And so many women were falsely accused of being witches when in truth they were not. Um, I don't say that the men were not persecuted, but I say that this is what happened. And um, if you actually look at the original template um, uh, things of what was drawn up by St. Bernard of Clerval, he actually said that these there were five groups that the Templars always had to give free passage to and shelter to. And one of them were the Kafars. So the Templar holdings in southern France those Templars were supposed to be neutral at that stage, but there was no way they could be neutral. Just like St. Bernard of Clerval, because they were the same kin, they were the same people. And I mean, later the, the Templars themselves were so persecuted.
I was in a in one of the Templar churches, and finally we were driving along, and that's the first time I ever get on that road, and we're right next to the old river. And as we're driving along, I said to Christina, "There's a there's a round bridge that goes like this, and there is a Templar holding right next to it." And I saw myself right riding with with some Templars over this bridge. And she said, "How did you know that?" I said, "Well, <laughs> I remembered." And sure enough, it was. It's just that day we were late because we had to go to somewhere else. And I stopped there and I had absolute shivers. And I picked up that the Templar was murdered there. And um, my camera took actually got something a camera I picked up. But later on, we went to this church and, um, and we listened to a music concert. I love it. In France, uh, the churches are used for musical programs, you know, beautiful classical music and, and whatever else. So they're using their churches for that. It's beautiful. The French have music in their soul. Just It's, it's a poetry. It's the, the old troubadours have never died. They're there in the French. It's even the French language is musical. It it's, mm. it's comes from the heart. And um, anyway, this church was round. It wasn't. It wasn't like you know, like the 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 other church was always square or whatever, running it uh, in the form of a cross. Um, this church, the acoustics in that church were out of this world, and I could. The energy was such that I just had to get outside, and I sat myself on this ancient bench that the Templars had originally put outside the door of the church. And I was under the starlit sky, and it was to me just the most beautiful thing to sit under the starlit sky, although this, the sky looks different there. <laughs> I miss my southern cross. <laughs> anyway, uh, and this music flowed over me, and I had this most beautiful, beautiful sense of peace. And I felt that this place was actually created in love and with love by those men who were then totally dedicated to the ideal of people working together as one. And that's what the Templars always did. They always involved the community. They were self-sufficient. They actually followed the process of the Essenes to the core. So they upheld the idea of unity and oneness that we now need to consciously move into. And that's what the Cathars also held. And that unity and oneness actually existed on planet Earth. It existed in Elysium, it existed in the Lion Kingdom, it existed in Avalon, it existed in the Mu, Mu because Mu rose the time of Avalon, and then Lemuria, and then Atlantis later, but it was in a lower octave because they couldn't reach that higher anymore. And it's deeply buried into the consciousness of humankind in all and every form. It's what we in truth know, and it's what we all yearn for, is to finally come back to, into that oneness and unity again. And I felt that intensely when I was in this, when I was standing that day at Ronle Chateau outside, where I opened the mystery school of, of Mary Magdalene, I saw a mountain in the distance and I pointed to it and I said to Christina, you need to go there. That's the next step. And uh, she looked at me and she said, oh, that's Bugaresh. Well, I had no idea where Bugaresh was, but, um, you know, we got there a few days later. And it was also, when, when we went through those mountains, uh, there's just outside um, Bugaresh, there's a Templar holding again on the mountain on top. And the gorge that's there, the, uh, the energy there is just out of this world. It's just amazing. Bugaresh mountain is amazing in itself. Intense energy there. But anyway, we got into this um, a little village, and there was this church. Now, there was nothing sort of like spectacular about the church. It was just a plain and simple church, um, not big, small. And it was sort of like evening time, uh, and uh, 
And Christina said, well, let's get in. I said, well, you know, I, I don't think, you know, we can't see anything. But somehow or other, she found the light switch and we went in. And I was, I was walking inside this door and I was just like, you know, I felt myself drawn to the high altar, the altar, I think. And, you know, in all the Catholic churches, you've got altars on either side, whatever, but it's finding it. And I looked at this altar and I saw there's the Cathar cross and the Templar cross. And on the wall is the Cathar cross and the Templar cross. Next to it, there's a woman bishop. And next to her is the Divine Mother ascending into heaven, standing on a serpent. There's a symbol there on the altar that I've never seen in any other churches I've ever been into. I, I was looking at this, and the next minute, this energy came down, which I cannot describe. I found myself on my knees and I had the most profound anointing of my life and it came with Jeshua and Mary Magdalene there with me and my ascended masters and angels and Zeraphine and, well, the divine, of course. I will never forget that moment. And then I understood that this was the original site where everybody was anointed. If they came through the initiations of the original mystery schools that were there. Anyway, I got out of that. And in the meantime, Christina hadn't even noticed what was going on. But she, she said she was, she was drawn to the altars on the side. And then she started calling me. She said, come, 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 have a look. So on this side altar, there were three candelabra, and they were pure gold. And she, they were actually so looked like ordinary candelabra, but she was now drawn to look on the other side, and then she turned them around for me to have a look at. And on these candelabra were Mary Magdalene, Jeshua, and Joseph of Arimathea. Mm -hmm. I photographed these and I told myself, it, it seemed important at the time. And to me, it just confirmed that this was a place of anointing in whatever way you look at it. And blow me down, six months later, I get someone who threw a someone that was in Egypt at the time sending a photograph of a stella that's in one of the Coptic churches in the desert in Egypt. And it had Jesus and his disciples on it in the stella. Right next to Jesus is Mary Magdalene. The same faces that are on the candelabra of this church that I was in appear in this stella. And she is depicted as a woman, not as the other men's disciples. Which makes it unusual. And that is what, when I went to Egypt later, because I was called to Del Delphi and Greece, and then uh, that was in 2019, and then Egypt, that will be my next book. I went to that Coptic monastery. And I saw the Stella. Now that Coptic monastery was where Joseph and Mary, when they fled from Israel, stayed in the grottoes there. To me, that showed again that all these strands of knowledge mm -hmm. are all coming together now so that we can awaken in the deepest consciousness to the truth that has always been there, but that so many souls gave their highest life for. 
You know, in the last two years, so many souls who have been kafas have found themselves to me for soul readings. And I've understood that in the context of that vow that the Cathars and the Templars made, that they would return and bring their original truthful knowledge back to humankind and what was before. And it culminates now at exactly at this time where all this information comes together and we awaken to the highest consciousness where we can access it again and understand that universal truth is universal truth. And that is what the Druids knew in their own way because they were part of a mystery school that was in Ireland in New Grange and it was held there by the Druids, and in Wales it was on that sacred island that you drew my attention to. It's Iona, it's Orkney, it's those places where they literally energetically stored energy too, in Brittany, in France, and whatever Europe, I haven't been in the rest of Europe so I wouldn't know, but there, but there are places like that. The Templars later brought their knowledge to uh, safeguard it in Portugal to get back away from the Pope. And then later in Scotland, and well, it's gone now to America apparently, but I don't know. In any case, it's not. That is another story in another way, in another whatever. <laughs> it's not, <laughs> that's not for me to tell. But to me, these places on our reawakening in the highest sense, like the pyramids, like everything is awakening. With, so that this is already put into that third new, the, the new earth, the new consciousness, as we return to the fifth and seventh dimensional state and higher. And then transfigure into that new lighter, excuse me, the lighter body. So that this can be brought to humanity with great love. Because the Qatars always held the book of love. And that book of love will only see is something that is written in your soul. It's not a physical book. It's actually where the divine feminine and the divine masculine are in perfect harmony and balance and equilibrium. And you can access that higher consciousness state, like the sun disks they downloaded into you, so that you become a living book of life for others, a living book of love, a living book of light, a living book of knowledge that can be read by other souls. And to come back to the Druids, we were traveling from Orleans, we were traveling to Brittany. And as we're traveling through these vineyards, I suddenly said to, said to, I picked up this golden city of the Druids, the Bards, the Bards, because there were three Druidic orders. And the Bards were not only musicians, but they were also oracles in a lot of ways. Because through their music and their poems and their, and their, and their songs, the ballads that they put, they always brought through storylines the truth to the people. They were then living, um, messengers in the way that their music touched the heart and soul. So direct contact between heart and heart, between music, because music uh, plays with your soul strings. That's why the harp was so necessary to the Druids, because a harp is one of your highest frequencies instruments. And when the church took over, they banned the harps in Wales and also in Ireland. They banned the harps. It shows you something. So the... the so I said, well, turn off here. We've got to turn that way. So they said, well, why don't we all get turned? And in any case, we turn off. And we find this absolute dilapidated barn. It's really falling to pieces. And uh, 
that there's also cars there parked under the trees. And then we see this chapel and it's, there's just the skeleton of this chapel. It looks like it's burned down. And I said, well, this is where the sacred groves of the Druids were and where the Golden City was. In any case, there's a building there that, that sort of managed to survive. And uh, it's a restaurant now, and they made a golf course there. Okay. So, <laughs> so it was lunchtime. So we, had, we first had lunch before we went there. I said, well, we need to energy work here because the bards want us to reopen the energy lines here. In any case, here the waiter appears, and he looks just like a bard. <laughs> <laughs> So I say to Christina, please ask her what this what this place is called. So he said, yeah, it's 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 the place of the bards. So the French name is it's not the French, it's the original Celtic name that he gave us, is the place of the bards. So I, I said, to, well, ask him, you know, what happened here? Why is this, everything is looking so sad and dilapidated here? So he told us a story. He said, well, he said, you know, th there was a chateau here. The chateau burned down three times, okay? And then they built the chapel there, and the chapel burned down. And then the barn, the barn burned down. Until they finally realized, you know, the Druids <laughs> would not allow them to build where they're not supposed to build. Mm -hmm. So they actually left the forest and they built a golf course around all of this. So then it was peace. And now they can have a, you know, they have to play their golf and so on, but they're not allowed to build in these places because it's sacred, you know, whatever. And in any case, um, when I, I did energy work then, it was so beautiful because you could see this energy coming through all these. I, I don't know what trees they are because I don't know the European trees, but anyway, I think they were birch trees. I'm not quite sure, but in any case, they, um, uh, it, it was the same. It was such, you know, in, in where the forest was still preserved, there was this beautiful, beautiful energy. But in any case, as we worked on it, I could see, you know, how the energy was lifted and it was bringing back. And it was so funny because when we got back into the car, the druids were jumping behind. <laughs> they actually were traveling with us. And when we got to Karnak, um, I was having to do energy work with, with, the, with, the, with the stones, the standing stones. And remember, those standing stones go on for kilometers. It's vast within it. But in any case, it was a public holiday, and it was burning hot. I think it was something like 37 or something. It was incredibly hot. And um, and the French, they put this fence around it, a you know, fence, and uh, now you can't get in or whatever. And you have to, and there's a little pavement like this, and then there's a main street that goes right next to it, or whatever. So now I had to do this energy work and this burning sun. You know, what I'm even not used to in South Africa, but in any case, it was fine. <laughs> There was a mother stone there. She was like the, the goddess stone that was on that side there. There's some buildings behind her, but, the, you know, the, and um, that was the first key to unlock the rest. In any case, we were doing that, and the druids actually stood all around the stone and were surrounding it and were amplifying the energy, were wanting it to open up that whole grid. But so interesting, when I got home and I started to, um, well, to the hotel, uh, we started to unload my camera pictures. The camera had actually picked up the roots. And they always wore white garments because the white actually depicted purity. Mm. To not misuse your power. Um, when the Romans later came and it was said that they sacrificed people, that was when they already were had fallen. You know, that was long after Avalon had come and gone. But there were always those that stayed true. It was a faction that actually split from them for all sorts of other reasons um, that later did the sacrifices. But that was also in in, in conjunction with certain um, chiefs and things, you know, that later had come a bit corrupted in whatever form or way. But the essence and spirit of, of the Druids were always pure and held and contained much knowledge. But because they were so persecuted later, um, they simply did not share what they knew anymore.
to death. Uh, it has been mind blowing. All the information that you've shared today, it's, it's immense and it's incredible. And I would encourage anybody listening to really take a look at your book. And I will share the details below this conversation so people can find you and the details to your book and everything easily. Every time we come together, it is always an illumination. And we are so, so grateful and appreciative to you for sharing your time so beautifully and generously with us today. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Lois, for inviting me. And yeah, and may uh, Wales, Wales be blessed, your homeland, for returning there. Um, and yeah, you've got, you're called there for back there for a reason. Like many people will just be called to some part of the world for a reason now. And, uh, and that's, that's as it's meant to be. Because we have so much of our soul somewhere along the line, as I was saying, you know, France holds it, that um, as we are there on the places, the memory banks get triggered and then we get activated in a higher degree. So that's my wish for you. You are quite sure that miracles will happen there in lots of ways. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So much love to you, Judith. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And everybody, thank you so much. Thank you.